Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Jeffords, an orthopedic spine surgeon and co-medical director of Resurgeon Spine Center in Atlanta, Georgia. If you are someone who is suffering from lower back pain and radiating leg pain, numbness, or weakness, symptoms otherwise known as sciatica or radiculopathy, you may be one of the thousands of people each year who suffer from a herniated disc of the lumbar spine. What I would like to do in this video is to explain what a herniated disc is, review the treatment options for herniated discs, and answer many of the commonly asked questions about herniated discs and sciatica. In order to understand what a herniated disc is, it helps to begin with an understanding of the anatomy of your lower back. The spinal column consists of 33 bones called vertebra that are stacked one on top of the other like building blocks. In the lumbar spine, there are five of these vertebrae, labeled L1 through L5. The L5 is at the bottom and sits above the sacrum, or tailbone. In between each of these vertebrae, there are spinal discs, which serve as cushions or shock absorbers for the spine. The disc between L4 and L5 is called the L4-5 disc. The bottom disc is called the L5-S1 disc. Behind the column of bone and disc is the spinal canal, which is formed by a series of bony arches called lamina that are each attached to their corresponding vertebra by columns of bone called pedicles. Each arch sequentially hooks onto the one below on either side, slightly behind and to the sides of the spinal canal. Where these arches hook together, they form a pair of joints called facet joints. Running through the spinal canal is the spinal cord, which runs down from the brain and comes all the way down and stops at the first lumbar vertebra. Below L1, there is no longer a spinal cord, only nerves that have branched off the spinal cord. Sometimes these spinal nerves are called nerve roots because they look like roots branching off of a tree trunk. These nerves travel down through the remainder of the spinal canal, contained within a sac of spinal fluid. At each disc level, a pair of these spinal nerves, one on each side, exits from the spinal canal and radiates down the legs to supply the muscles, joints, and skin throughout the legs and feet. The spinal nerves exit from the spinal canal through tunnels called foramen that are bordered by the disc in front and the facet joints in the back. Irritation or pinching of these spinal nerves can result in radiating leg pain or numbness. These leg symptoms are technically known as radiculopathy, but many people call these symptoms sciatica. Radiculopathy can be caused by several conditions, including stenosis, which is narrowing of the spinal canal, disc degeneration, and disc herniations. To understand disc herniations, we need to take a closer look at the structure of the disc. Each spinal disc consists of two parts, an outer wall called the annulus, which is like a tough ligament made of fibers woven together, and an inner nucleus, which is like a firm gel. Most lumbar disc herniations are not caused by a sudden injury, but caused by gradual disc degeneration due to the normal aging process. This process happens in all of us, but in some people it may progress at a faster rate or start at an earlier age. This is mostly determined by genetics. With normal aging and disc degeneration, small tears in the disc's outer annulus develop and slowly enlarge over time. The annulus becomes weaker and pressure from the inner nucleus may cause the annulus to start to bulge. Some degree of disc bulging is normal after the age of 35 or so. Eventually, the tears in the annulus may become large enough so that a portion of the inner jelly-like nucleus can push completely through the tear, backwards into the spinal canal. When this happens, it is called a ruptured or herniated disc. Occasionally, trauma or an episode of heavy lifting causes sudden rupture of the disc, resulting in a more rapid onset of symptoms. A herniated disc can cause leg pain in two ways. First, the material from the nucleus that has ruptured into the spinal canal can cause mechanical pressure on the spinal nerves. Secondly, the material from the nucleus has chemicals in it that can cause the nerve roots to become very irritated. Both the pressure on the nerve and the chemical irritation can lead to nerve inflammation and problems with how the nerve root functions. The combination of the two can cause pain, weakness, and numbness in the area of the body to which the nerve supplies sensation. Some of the treatments for disc herniation only affect the chemical irritation, while others can affect both. Before going into the treatment options for lumbar disc herniation, it is important to understand what happens if you do nothing. Physicians call what happens when you do nothing the natural history. 
It is important to realize that a lot of people without back or leg pain are walking around with herniated discs and that not all disc herniations cause symptoms. When you do experience back and leg pain from a herniated disc, in many cases it is a temporary flare-up and the symptoms can resolve on their own without specific treatment. Also, when you have a herniated disc, the nuclear material that has protruded out through the annulus into the spinal canal may slowly dissolve over time, relieving the nerve compression without the need for surgery. Despite the fact that many disc herniations do not need treatment, there are instances when disc herniations can cause significant neurologic dysfunction. Generally, the larger the herniation, the more severe the symptoms. In some cases, a large herniation can cause such severe nerve compression that it can cause significant muscle weakness in the leg and foot. The longer this muscle weakness remains present, the higher the chances that the leg weakness could become permanent. Fortunately, this is rare. Another rare condition is cauda equina syndrome. This occurs when a very large herniation causes severe compression of all the nerve roots running through the spinal canal, including the nerves that supply the bladder and bowels. When this occurs, it can cause loss of control of the bowel and bladder function, leading to incontinence. This is considered to be a surgical emergency, and urgent surgical removal of the disc herniation is needed in these circumstances. The typical lumbar disc herniation does not cause cauda equina syndrome or dramatic muscle weakness, and generally causes radiating leg pain and numbness of varying degrees. In these cases, treatment for the disc herniation can generally be broken into three separate phases of treatment. Phase one includes non-invasive treatments, phase two includes spinal injections, and phase three is surgery, which is oftentimes not needed. The goals of treatment for each phase should be to relieve pain and improve function. Phase one of treatment consists of non-invasive options, including oral medications, physical therapy, home exercises, and local ice and heat. In most cases, these treatments are prescribed based on your symptoms and physical examination alone before confirming the actual presence of a herniated disc with an MRI scan. The medications may include steroids, which are powerful anti-inflammatories, and non-steroid anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen. These medications do not shrink the disc herniation, but instead reduce the chemical irritation of the nerve by blocking inflammation. Pain relievers such as Tylenol can also help. Occasionally, stronger pain relievers such as muscle relaxants and narcotic painkillers are prescribed for short-term flare-ups of severe pain. Physical therapy involves specific back exercises that strengthen your back, reducing the stress on the disc. There are also specific exercises that can temporarily slightly pull the disc away from the nerve, reducing the nerve irritation. If your radiating leg pain fails to improve with physical therapy and medications, an MRI scan is required to confirm the presence of a disc herniation before proceeding to phase two. Phase two of treatment for a disc herniation is lumbar epidural steroid injections. These are outpatient procedures where steroid medicine is injected into the spinal canal using x-ray guidance. The steroid medicine is injected right over the pinched nerve and the steroid medicine blocks the inflammation of the nerve hopefully allowing the symptoms to resolve and eliminating the need for surgery. Sometimes more than one injection is needed, and a series of two or three injections given over a six to 12 week period may be required. The injections may be performed by a spine surgeon, but are more commonly performed by non-surgical spine specialists called physiatrists, or by anesthesia pain specialists. Phase three of treatment for a disc herniation is surgery. If epidural steroid injections have failed to provide significant relief of leg pain, surgical removal of the disc herniation may be required. In some cases, patients have such severe leg pain or leg weakness that injections are bypassed and surgery is offered. The surgical procedure for removing a lumbar disc herniation is called a microdiscectomy. This is usually an outpatient procedure lasting about 45 minutes to an hour. It is done through a small, less than one inch incision and has about a 95% success rate. In summary, lumbar disc herniations are common, in many cases cause minimal or temporary symptoms, and oftentimes do not need specific treatment. In cases where disc herniations cause significant leg pain, medications and therapy are usually effective. Epidural steroid injections are sometimes needed, and in a small percentage of patients, surgery is required. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. You may have additional questions, and if so, you may want to consult with your spine physician. <laughs>